Welcome to today's symposium, a public lecture that is supported by the Franklin Institute. Uh, John Rogers, who is the Franklin Medalist in Material Science and Engineering. It's a great uh, chance to be here, and I, I really uh, you know, look forward to this opportunity, kind of interacting with you guys um, and uh, sharing with you some of the some of the things that we've been working on, I guess over the last 10, maybe 15 years by now, we just kind of highlight the most recent stuff, but it's an area we've been uh, exploring for, for a long time. Of course, um, you know, the context here is in, in, the, in, in the Franklin uh, Medal, and you uh, heard Judy provide some perspective on that. You saw, saw the video. I think she said something about Einstein and Tesla, and uh, that's insane. So that's, that's completely in a different, different realm, but it certainly is uh, humbling. and. Uh, and a great honor. I mean, I think these uh, kinds of awards, though, especially in, in my case anyway, are really, I think, designed to uh, acknowledge a set of accomplishments. And for, uh, for me, that means um, you know, a lot of wonderful collaborators. And so I just want to sort of acknowledge, I think probably we're one of the most collaborative uh, groups around. Most of our you know, most impactful papers will involve multiple you know, senior uh, PIs and different fields of expertise. This is kind of a sh uh, snapshot of a set of folks that we've worked pretty closely with over the last 10 years. I think cumulatively probably three, 350, 300, 350 papers you know, co-authored with, with these guys all the way from theoretical uh, mechanics to uh, device physics, material science, surface chemistry, interventional cardiology, neuroscience, um, on and on. And so uh, the, these are the guys who, who are really uh, you know, winning this award in a sense. And, uh, my name just happens to get attached to it. So I want to start by, by acknowledging those senior PIs, and then maybe most importantly, the students and the postdocs who actually uh, do the work. So this is a snapshot of the, the group that we took uh, over the summer. And so it's a really you know, incredibly talented uh, collection of uh, kids, right? And, um, and, and they you know, uh, really drive the progress in the group. And primarily, I get to talk about it, and I get tasked with raising the, uh, the financing to support the group. That those, those are two, my two main uh, roles. But I've been very fortunate over the years, very, very talented uh, people. Xin Ning is an example of, of someone who's on the faculty uh, here now, and Larry Cheng uh, as well. So really, really spectacularly accomplished uh, postdocs and, and moving on in, into their own independent careers. So I thought I would just start with that and then kind of uh, give you an outline of um, some of the uh, topics I hope to share with you um, in the next 45 minutes or, or so. And uh, so the title is Bioresorbable Electronic Medicines. That's only about a half of the talk. That's kind of some uh, over the horizon things that we've been uh, thinking about and, and working on now for the last five or six years uh, in this area of uh, materials and device development for uh, platforms that can interface with the human body in novel ways with the potential to have a, a positive impact on how we think about uh, health care and, and wellness and, and well-being. So that's kind of the last half of the talk, but I'm going to start with a, a little bit broader uh, picture on how we view areas of opportunity in this space at the intersection between science and engineering and medicine, where we think uh, you know, the frontiers uh, exist. Uh, and then I'll talk to you about some things where we feel like we have a handle on, on kind of what we're doing and what, what the key materials uh, sets are and uh, how, how to actually build systems and get them into a hospital environment onto actual patients and then, uh, you know, on a trajectory toward uh, broader deployment. So that'll give you a sense of, uh, you know, what our aspirations are long term. And like I said, I'll kind of conclude with this uh, newer uh, area, which, which uh, you know, we're, we're really just, just beginning to uh, explore. So uh, most of our uh, work these days is uh, focused on thinking about uh, materials and new device concepts that allow electronic sort of semiconductor functionality to be integrated with the human body in ways that are currently impossible based on the kind of microsystems technologies that you would see in consumer electronics. And maybe the most, uh, the sort of the easiest uh, area of opportunity to think about in that space is uh, devices that integrate with the brain. So the brain is biology's most sophisticated form of electronics, and uh, I think a grand challenge in scientific inquiry is to understand the underpinnings of how the brain uh, operates, not only from the standpoint of an academic intellectual pursuit, but the idea that that understanding could lead to new therapies for treating brain disorders. And because it's an electrical system, if you want to um, study that uh, ki kind of uh, organ uh, system, maybe the the, the thing that you would like to do is to bring to bear to that problem man's most sophisticated forms of electronics, the silicon CMOS integrated circuit. Uh, and if you think about uh, trying to do that in, in a straightforward sort of obvious way, you're confronted with the uh, reality that there are profound 
mismatches in mechanics and geometry and, and materials properties between sort of a wafer-based form of uh, electronics uh, and, and circuit uh, technology and the soft time dynamic curvilinear textures of the brain. And so the idea would be that uh, if you could figure out material sets and fabrication approaches and device designs that would allow you to reformulate silicon CMOS technology into thin biocompatible soft membranes that could sort of softly and gently conform to the textures of the brain, remain there for long periods of time to do high resolution uh, electrical mapping, uh, that might be a very powerful tool in neuroscience research. And it may also be a platform deli uh, for delivering engineered forms of medicines to treat brain disorders through electrical stimulation or optical stimulation and so on. So that, that would be uh, one place where, where one might want to get started in this area of um, soft electronics for the human body. But it wouldn't be the only place. Like if you could crack that problem, that you'd probably want to leverage that same technology for interfaces to other vital organs of the body. The human heart, for example, it's an electromechanical system. And so if you could develop circuits that could wrap the entire epicardial surface, almost like an artificial instrumented pericardium, you might be able to do high resolution spatiotemporal electrophysiological mapping that would allow you to pick up an arrhythmia before it became problematic. Maybe deliver spatiotemporally varying patterns of stimulation to eliminate that uh, arrhythmia before uh, it, it could cause a, a health condition. So augmenting uh, organ function in that way uh, might be uh, interesting uh, as well. So we've worked a lot on the brain, the heart, uh, the spinal cord, the peripheral nervous system, the bladder, but most of our work has been on uh, a skin interfaced uh, type of technology, skin being the largest organ of the body and a non-invasive point uh, of, of, of interfacing that, that would allow one to get you know, devices onto real human uh, subjects uh, sooner rather than, than later. And so I'll focus on, on skin as an interface. And then in the context of bioresorbable electronics, I'll talk about peripheral nervous system and the, and the cardiac uh, system uh, as well. So um, one thing that, that might be useful to, to consider is, is to uh, think about the design principles that are inherent to uh, biological systems, not so much with an eye toward replicating those uh, features in engineered systems, but uh, from the standpoint of abstracting the key concepts and sort of embodying those principles in uh, man-made devices to facilitate the kind of uh, bio-integration that we and others uh, kind of have in mind in this space. And so uh, these are sort of obvious things, but they're useful to, to keep in mind. Unlike you know, silicon CMOS technology, it's primarily a planar uh, te technology. Biology is intrinsically three-dimensional. Uh, it combines hard and soft materials into dynamic, reconfigurable, responsive uh, platforms that involve functional materials across a very broad range of length scales. And these are the kinds of ideas that, uh, that would be useful to consider in the context of uh, microsystems technologies. And so uh, with that in mind, we uh, perceive sort of three sort of separate uh, front frontier areas is kind of how we view things. Others have you know, their, their, their own uh, ideas, but this is kind of how we uh, view the world of possibilities in this area of biointegrated electronics. One is in thin, soft membranes, as I referred to in the context of the brain, but allowing integration on surfaces of soft, time dynamic tissue systems. And I'll give you some specific examples of what we're doing to address currently unmet clinical needs with these kinds of skin-like devices, where the interface to the skin provides a, a a window for measuring with clinical grade precision underlying physiological processes. So I'll give you a very specific uh, idea of how that, how that plays out in, into devices we deployed into the hospital environment. The other one is uh, something I'll touch on toward the end of the talk. This is the idea of bioresorbable electronics. So think about like a resorbable suture, uh, you know, that it's a, it's a sort of simple mechanical device that serves an important function in the context of a time uh, dependent biological process where the device is only needed for a certain period of time, correlated in that case to a wound healing process. Uh, you can think about the same kind of system, but in the context of full active electronic devices. So not just a mechanical platform, but something that can provide wireless uh, data communication uh, capabilities, uh, diagnostics, therapeutics, and so on. So building a set of electronic materials that are bioresorbable, dissolvable in water to biocompatible end products is something we've been thinking about. And then this last area of the three that, that we see, uh, perceive some uh, you know, important opportunities is in going from 2D to 3D. So 3D in these kind of open 
uh, network type ar architectures reminiscent of neural networks in the brain or vascular trees in, in the cardiac system or cytoskeletons kind of at the, at the cellular uh, length scale. So how do you go from 2D, 3D is something, something that, that we think is worth, uh, worth thinking about. For all three of those areas, the core question from the standpoint of material science is what are you going to use for the semiconductor? You can think about metals and dielectrics a little bit less challenging, but the active material becomes uh, you know, a central question in terms of how uh, one, one wants to try to make progress along those three uh, axes. And um, you, know, you can think about uh, opportunities separated out in terms of organic-based semiconductors and then inorganic ones. And maybe as a first pass in that consideration, you might identify mobility, field effect mobility, as a key metric for comparing different uh, uh, possibilities. Um, listed here in units of centimeter squared per volt second. And this parameter is basically telling you how fast you can switch a transistor on and off for a given set of design rules and how much current you can produce from that device. And we and others have spent a lot of time on polymer-based semiconductor materials with kind of, a, in this context, with kind of an intuitive sense that plastics would be more naturally compatible with soft biological uh, systems than silicon would be, for example. Uh, and so there's been a lot of progress in, in polymers. I think you know, people have been working on this topic probably 35, 40 years by now. But still, the uh, performance characteristics are sort of orders of magnitude uh, away from what, what you can do today with, with silicon and, and even further away from uh, some of the three fives that are available. So if you think about carbon, maybe carbon nanotubes would be the ideal uh, bonding configuration of carbon from the standpoint of um, semiconductor charge transport uh, properties. And, and those, those classes of materials uh, do, in fact, offer extremely high performance capabilities, but how to organize them, how to assort them, how to build them into functional systems remains uh, a big challenge. So we, and obviously others, have worked there uh, you know, extensively over the years. Graphene 2D materials also maybe some options. But at the end of the day, you'd have to acknowledge that if you could figure out how to deploy silicon in these kind of uh, bio-integrated uh, systems, that's probably what you would want to do because there's you know, a 50-year history of global research around the basic scientific and engineering principles of how you use silicon in very sophisticated ways and uh, in a manufacturing uh, structure to, to add to that base of knowledge that, that would be wonderful to exploit if, if you could figure out how to, how to use silicon in these kinds of uh, contexts. And, um, you know, the primary challenge is one of geometry and mechanics. Um, as I mentioned before, the platform for all uh, commercially available forms of silicon integrated circuits are, you know, these uh, high performance ones anyway, are these uh, 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 material structures here, the semiconductor uh, wafer, silicon wafer uh, in particular. It's a wonderful piece of materials technology. It's commodity cost at this point. It's almost perfectly plain or very well matched to the kind of photolithographic processes that are used for manufacturing. But if you think about brain integration, you can immediately uh, appreciate the difficulties there. I mean, the wafer essentially has the properties of a plate of glass. It's very flat, but also very rigid. It doesn't bend. Uh, if you drop it, it shatters into a million pieces. And so at first blush, it may look like uh, you know, a class of material that's not going to be compatible with biology. But that turned out not to be the case, because you can bring to bear very simple concepts in mechanical engineering to sort of transform that material structure into uh, a system, a hard, soft, deterministic composite system where you can engineer essentially any set of mechanical properties precisely matched to those of uh, biology, target bi biological tissue. And I'll just skip through this very quickly because the concepts are simple and they're uh, some, somewhat uh, historical uh, at this point. It's basically two ideas for how you create stretchable forms of silicon, where you maintain the electronic properties and the sophistication in device engineering and manufacturing associated with silicon, but you transform it into a platform that's compatible with biology. The first idea is to just make the silicon super thin. So a wafer is um, you know, not a very bendable class of materials, partly because of the intrinsic properties of the silicon, but also partly because the wafer is thick. It's a millimeter uh, in thickness. You don't need that thickness in order to uh, you know, capture the kind of charge transport characteristics you need for high performance integrated circuits. And so you can uh, create ways to sort of anisotropically etch very thin ribbons and membranes and wires off the near surface region of the wafer, thick enough to support the kinds of de device technologies uh, that you're interested in, but thin enough to be mechanically flexible by virtue of the fact that the uh, bending stiffness scales like the cube of the thickness. So you go from a millimeter to 10 nanometers, as many orders of magnitude reduction in bending stiffness. So you begin to very flexible and floppy as illustrated with this scanning electron uh, microscope. And so you can think about that class of material then as a building block semiconductor that you can integrate with a flexible sheet of plastic to build high performance 
flexible electronics. But if you think about uh, what you need for biointegration, it goes beyond flexibility. So if you have a sheet of plastic, you can wrap a cylinder or a cone, but you can't do a sphere, much less a brain or a heart. So you need something that uh, adopts not only flexibility, but the intrinsic stretchability of uh, biological tissues, such as the skin or the uh, or, the, or brain tissue or heart, heart tissue. And so you add another simple idea on top of this uh, you know, observation that thin materials can be very flexible even if they're uh, high in modulus and, and re relatively brittle. Um, by taking those strips and then bonding them with the un underlying elastomer uh, substrate, but not, bu but not bonding them in a flat geometry in sort of a wavy buckled shape. And so in this way, you create a hard, soft, composite material that offers the stretchability defined by the substrate, but with the electronic properties defined by the hard material component, where you can think about this uh, combined hard, soft uh, material structure as having a physics of a, an accordion bellows in a sense. So you get an effective end-to-end -end stretchability, bendability, and so on. Uh, that's not limited by the fracture uh, limits of the uh, uh, hard, hard material here, but instead uh, you know, can uh, far exceed that limit by changes in the geometry associated with these wave structures, just like an, uh, an accordion bellows. So that, that's the basic uh, concept, and it turns out there are lots of engineering elaborations that you can add on top of that, so you can exploit not only out-of-plane buckling, but in-plane buckling as well. And so you can be begin to build circuit systems that rely on uh, sort of interconnected um, filamentary serpentine structures in sort of these mesh type geometries, which when bonded to a soft elastomer substrate with quantitative attention to the mechanics of that system, you can tailor the stress strain properties to really match uh, a targeted uh, you know, point of interface uh, with, with the body. And so these are some uh, calculations and some experimental observations of stress strain behaviors of this kind of uh, system where we've really dialed the uh, geometries and the thicknesses, the shapes of these uh, filaments such that the effective stress strain properties of that system are quantitatively matched to skin in spite of the fact that we can integrate uh, silicon, gallium arsenide, gallium uh, nitride onto those filaments. So the filaments become the support for the active materials, the underlying elastomer combined with that mesh structure to find the mechanical properties. So here we've sort of matched the linear response regime of skin illustrated in the uh, red curve there. But all these biological systems, they have this J-shaped stress strain curve. So you can actually go to the next level and with uh, more uh, attention paid to the geometries here, you can achieve that same type of J-shaped stress strain response in these artificial composite uh, materials with tailorable tangential modulus across a range of strains that are relevant uh, for biointegration. So for example, here we've uh, dialed in the geometries and the material properties of these mesh structures to quantitatively match the full nonlinear response of skin from different regions of the human body, two different regions on the back, one on the abdomen, where we have inverse design algorithms developed in close collaboration with Yang Gong Huang's group at Northwestern that allow us to define layouts to hit the kind of mechanical properties that we want. So you can quantitatively do this do this matching, and this becomes fairly agnostic to the materials properties of, of the mesh itself. You can do this over a very wide range of uh, you know, material classes that are well established for use in electronics and, and optoelectronics. So those are some pretty simple serpentines, just kind of these interconnected uh, horseshoe uh, shapes. You can get a little bit more sophisticated by adopting ideas from the uh, uh, from the fractal mathematics community. And so there it provides a, si a set of systematic design rules for telling you how to spool out a thin film of material with an arbitrary aerial coverage over a space uh, with a set of mechanics that are appealing because of the intrinsic self-similarity of the uh, fractal geometry. So it provides sort of access to a whole toolbox of different geometries, different kinds of design rules for tiling up areas with, uh, with filaments to, to achieve active systems that also have unique mechanical characteristics. So those are the, the basic ideas, just kind of at a high level. I'll sort of skip through a lot of the details and just make the comment that those uh, foundational ideas allow you to do pretty much anything you want in terms of electronic functionality in platforms that are intrinsically biocompatible from the standpoint of modulus uh, matching uh, characteristics. And so this is a, a first demonstration of some of the ideas. It wasn't a functional system, but a platform with the different kinds of active devices that uh, you know, led us to feel like we, we could uh, begin to get a handle uh, on the system. And so that was 2011. We got a little bit better uh, at it, uh, 2014. And then at that point, we decided we should focus on real clinical needs to demonstrate uh, how this technology could actually have translational uh, impact. 
And that's what I'm going to uh, describe to you uh, now. But before I do that, I'll just mention that the, uh, that the mechanics and, and the geometrical matching uh, is important. But for uh, using those platforms for sensing underlying biological processes, the aerial coverage with the skin turns out to be uh, critically important as well for minimizing thermal impedance uh, mismatch and minimizing electrical impedance uh, as well. And so these kind of mesh structures uh, naturally can conform to very uh, complex topographies that you encounter in biology. This is a colorized SEM of a polymer replica of human skin, where this uh, mesh kind of architecture can really conform to the, those surface contours everywhere except maybe the most uh, challenging sort of crevices that, that you see there. So not only from a standpoint of measurement fidelity, but uh, robustness of adhesive uh, in, in interfacing uh, as well as enhanced by that, kind of, uh, by that kind of contact. So you put all that together, it turns out that you can begin to build platforms that measure clinically uh, relevant biosignals with clinical grade precision, but without uh, kind of the bulky hardware that's currently sort of ubiquitous in a hospital uh, environment in platforms that can, can potentially be used outside of the hospital as well for continuous monitoring. So one obvious thing is you can do electrocardiography, so you can measure not only heart rate and heart rate variability, which you can do pretty well with a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, but you can capture the full waveform continuously, not just sporadically like you do with an Apple Watch uh, 4. Other kinds of things that you can do that rely critically on that uh, contact interface with the skin would be to measure the hydration level of the skin, currently done in, in sort of a episodic point contact way using a device called a corneometer. Uh, you can reproduce that functionality in these skin-like platforms as well, as well. Arterial tonometry, there you're monitoring the pulsatile dynamics of blood flow through near surface arteries. You can capture those kinds of signatures by embedding uh, piezoelectric uh, sensing functionality into these same type of, uh, type of platforms. So we and others by now have you know, published many, many papers, all different kinds of sensors that fit into this overall design framework, ranging from precise thermal characterization capabilities, again, for the skin, electrical measurements for underlying uh, organ uh, function, ECG, muscle activity, EMG, brain activity, EEG, uh, on and on, sweat. We can capture that in uh, uh, microliter volumes and do uh, biochemical analysis of uh, sweat composition, mechanical, measurement strain, motion, modulus, pressure, optical uh, as well. And you can also uh, capture mechanoacoustic signatures of body processes using high bandwidth, very precise accelerometer type systems. So what's all this good for? I'll show you one example. This is something that we um, really focused on sort of er early on because we um, sort of felt like th this would be a, a great match for the technology and also a great solution to an existing uh, challenge in clinical care, and that is in the neonatal uh, intensive care unit. So if you have a, a premature baby, they go immediately into the, into the NICU, where their uh, vital signs need to be monitored at clinical grade accuracy 24-7, because these babies are in a very fragile health status. And the way that that's done currently is shown here on the left, even at a level four NICU like we have at Lurie Children's Hospital in downtown Chicago. So it's a collection of um, sensors that interface to the skin with adhesive tapes uh, that have to have a strong offer a strong enough adhesion to the skin to keep the sensors in place in spite of forces that are inevitably applied through the connecting wires that interface those sensors to external boxes of electronics. The problem with that is that the uh, skin of these neonates is highly underdeveloped, it's very fragile. And so application and removal of these tapes, which typically happens on a 24-hour uh, cycle, often uh, leads to skin injuries. You actually damage the skin when you, when you remove the tape, so that, that, that's a problem. Uh, the bulk and the weight and the mechanics of the wires also frustrates natural motions of the babies uh, because their muscles are not very well developed, so they're kind of tied down by all of these wires. And one thing that we didn't fully appreciate when we got into this, but, but turns out to be maybe the most important uh, consideration, is that all these wires really frustrate parent-child interactions. That skin-to-skin -skin contact is known to have a uh, very uh, significant therapeutic value for the development of ba babies at this age. But for the parents to hold the babies, you've got to take the wires off typically, or you're tethered via the wires. And then when you put the baby back in the isolate, you have to uh, rewire them. So the vision that, and, and what we wanted to do is sort of illustrated on this slide. This is maybe four or five years old at this point. That was just Photoshop back, back in those days. But it was a useful slide to kind of keep the students and postdocs focused on what, what we're hoping to do here, which is to get rid of that rat's nest of wires and replace it with two or three of these uh, skin-like uh, electronic systems with wireless uh, fu functionality to provide a more humane way to do vital signs monitoring. 
And so I won't go through the details, don't really have time to, to do that uh, here, but the ideas, the basic ideas in material science and, and mechanical engineering that I described uh, to you previously combined with these uh, sensor capabilities can be brought together into a pair of devices that reproduce all vital signs monitoring capabilities at clinical grade precision but without the wires and without the tapes uh, and with a much uh, less invasive interface to the skin. So this is the uh, chest unit. It's a device that goes on the chest of the neonate. It's a battery-free wireless device, so the peanut-shaped structure with the uh, sort of serpentine filamentary uh, geometry around the perimeter of the device serves dual function then. It's uh, receiving wirelessly transmitted power from an antenna that goes in the base of the isolate. It's a couple of milliwatts or so. And then that same magnetic inductive link serves as a data communication channel for continuous streaming of ECG data, in this case, from this device. And it also has an embedded uh, temperature sensor, clinical grade temperature sensor that measures uh, surface temperature of the skin on the chest. And so for these kinds of trials, we have approval to get the devices into the actual NICU. So this is measurements from an actual baby in an operating NICU at Lurie Children's Hospital. The ECG tra trace in the bottom is wireless using this kind of skin-like or epidermal electronic system. And the ECG trace uh, at the top is uh, data that's collected with the conventional uh, taped on uh, sensors and external boxes of electronics. So we can do uh, quantitative comparisons between the fidelity of data that we're collecting to what's done currently uh, in the hospital. And you can see very uh, good correspondence there. So this patch gives you heart rate, heart rate variability, respiration rate, and temperature, an approximation to uh, core temperature, but very similar to the kinds of surface uh, temperature sensors that are used uh, clinically. Uh, so that's not all. You still need blood oxygenation. So we do that with a separate device mounted on the foot. So this is uh, an optoelectronic uh, epidermal uh, device. It's a pair of LEDs run uh, emitting in the red, one in the IR. They're switching on and off out of sequence. We have an integrated photo detector that's measuring backscattered light at each one of those wavelengths. That data is being streamed back to an external data acquisition unit. And from that kind of data, you can determine blood oxygenation level through this kind of photoplethysmography. And those two devices, furthermore, are time locked. So you actually get relative timing information so you can measure the time at which uh, a pulse of blood is initiated at the heart and the time that it arrives at the foot. And that pulse wave velocity has clinical meaning, meaning as I'll describe uh, in a second. So this is what it looks like deployed into the hospital. We're probably 90 babies into these uh, trials at this point. So we have full approval. We're in at a re very regular basis, two, three babies per week uh, typically. So it's a hardware-software combination. You have to put this together because the nurses won't use sort of an engineering type of uh, interface. They want the full graphical user interface that uh, correlates uh, to what they're used to uh, using uh, via their, their GE DASH system. So that's the way, it, the way it's set up. So you can see the ECG, there's SCG there uh, as well, and then the red and the IR channel from the PPG monitoring unit on the foot. And so we've had uh, these devices uh, tested and validated on babies with a very wide range of gestational ages, all within that neonate uh, cohort in the NICU down to 26 week delivery. That's a 26 week delivery there. So just to orient you, 24 week delivery is known as the edge of viability. So about half of the 24 week uh, babies don't make it. So this is about as fragile as you will, uh, of a baby that you will see in, in a NICU. And this is actually one of a pair of twins that was delivered at 26 weeks. So very, very tiny, very fragile babies, but uh, these devices work extremely well there uh, also. So this is kind of what what it looks like, this is a, a picture. You can see the hand of, the, of Aaron Hamvas over here. He's head of neonatology at Lurie. You can see our device is mounted on the chest here, and you can see the wired, wired systems uh, there. So, th so this has been a uh, very, very successful uh, effort. The nurses are very enthusiastic about it, so we've actually migrated the technology out of the NICU and into the PICU, which is the pediatric intensive care unit. These babies are a little bit older. Uh, but they also require 24-7 uh, monitoring. So this is a, a baby uh, from the PICU, again, at Lurie uh, with his mother. Uh, they're engaging as what, in what is known as kangaroo care. So again, it's that skin-to-skin -skin contact. You can see the uh, foot device, the LEDs lit up there. You can see the chest device there. So the transmission and receive antennas in the base of the chair uh, in this case. But all the wires go, go away. And so this is something that... Uh, that makes the babies happy, the mothers are happy, we're happy, uh, nurses are happy. It's been a great, great project uh, in, in that sense. This is kind of uh, an interesting image. This is that same baby. He's rotating around to look at the, uh, uh, the guy taking the, the picture in this case. Here we have the chest unit mounted on the back. 
because in certain instances, it's just more convenient to have it on the back if the mother and baby are having sort of chest-to-chest -chest contact. Putting it on the back is, uh, is an equally valid place to measure ECG. But here you can see that the skin is wrinkling in a natural way as the baby rotates around. And the device, because it has this skin-like characteristic, can just follow that wrinkling uh, without any kind of mechanical constraint. And so that reduces or eliminates any kind of skin surface irritation or discomfort associated with the device. It also turns out to uh, decrease the propensity for delamination. because The device is so thin and so soft, uh, the interface stresses are greatly uh, minimized by, by that kind of uh, construction. So the degree of adhesive that's needed to keep these devices on the skin is more than a factor of 10 lower than the adhesive strength of the tapes that are needed to keep the wired devices uh, adhered. So we're pretty deep into these uh, studies. This is the, the kind of data, I mean, it's big data by, by any definition. This is just extracted heart rate from the ECG waveforms and SpO2 from the PPG waveforms. So this is uh, you know, just a tiny fraction of the total amount of data that we've collected. These are four million data points both on the left uh, and the right. And these are Bland-Altman plots. It provides a way to look at the, uh, uh, the degree of agreement between our measurements and clinical gold standards, very tight. So well within uh, you know, the kind of variance that the FDA looks at for uh, you know, proving, proving new de device technology. These are not FDA approved, but we're moving in that direction. The other thing that we can do is we can actually go beyond clinical standards. So one very simple thing is we're measuring temperature not only at the chest, but also the foot. And so looking at differences in temperature can uh, provide information on the degree of circulation, uh, cardiovascular he health of the babies. The other thing that we can do, as I mentioned before, these are two time-locked measurements. So we're capturing pulse wave velocity. And that pulse wave velocity is telling you something about arterial stiffness and blood pressure. So it turns out it quantitatively correlates the systolic blood pressure. This is in a uh, subject uh, in the PICU, but this is... Um, uh, this is an arterial line, so it's rare to find babies that, that require an arterial line. This particular baby did, so you're measuring the arterial pressure using that uh, invasive uh, device, and then we're overlaying a plot of this pulse arrival time on that data. So it looks very promising as a non-invasive way to capture blood pressure, which is something that's not currently done routinely because pressure cuffs tend to uh, lead to skin uh, damage and, and muscle, muscle damage uh, as well. So anyway, this is a, uh, quite a complex uh, project. Uh, we've done lots of big projects in the past. This is probably a high water mark for us anyway. It was f uh, 45 uh, co-authors in material science, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, biomedical, computer science. There's some in-sensor analytics that has to be done in order to make the devices operate in a stable way, dermatology, neonatology, and pediatrics. So it's not just graduate students, undergrads, and postdocs, also nurses, doctors, and, and faculty. So this was just published on uh, March 1st. And so I'll show you, um, you know, it captured a lot of press, not that uh, focused on press. This is John LaPook, who's the chief medical correspondent from C uh, CBS. And there was a lot, a lot of coverage here, and I don't want to sort of focus on that, but I will roll this video because it provides a good context of how the parents and the nurses and the neonatologists are uh, viewing uh, the technology. So this is four minutes. So I'm, I'm going to roll that and, and kind of let this go because I think you'll find this interesting. So anyway, that's kind of a starting point for our, uh, us, I think, in kind of what we're aspiring to do. We have um, substantial funding now from the Gates Foundation and the Save the Children Foundation for taking these devices and deploying them into the developing world. So the schedule is to do 20,000 units between now uh, and the end of the year uh, in India, Pakistan, Zambia, and also uh, Kenya. So we're right kind of in the, in the middle of trying, trying to make that happen. So the same uh, technologies can go to the home. That's pretty, pretty straightforward. They can also be adapted and deployed on adults. And so we probably have 23, 24 different active IRB approved studies, human clinical trials and pilot studies on different devices in the, in the operating room and Parkinson's patients, stroke patients, expecting mothers, so maternal, fetal, as well as neonatal uh, health. And it's been a very productive area for us. And uh, we're looking forward to um, you know, uh, mo moving this forward, and, and I think you know, there's, there's a community of uh, researchers ar ar across the country and the globe that are uh, working on similar things. It seems like it's, it'll be a, a very exciting time for sort of digital information-enabled uh, medicine beyond what's uh, done today. So we're, for the last uh, 20 minutes or so, I'll kind of shift gears and talk about something that's uh, a little bit um, you know, more sort of over the horizon than, than some of these skin interface devices and thinking about uh, implants. And so some of the same concepts, as I mentioned a few times, uh, that allow you to get on the skin, allow deployment on the brain, the heart, other soft 
tissue systems of the body. We've done a lot in the brain, a lot in the cardiac uh, space. And so you can think about these implants kind of in two regimes of use. One uh, would require just a relatively short time of integration with the body where the uh, value might be in a diagnostic surgical context. And uh, we're working in that space with Brian Litt uh, at University of Pennsylvania for mapping out electrical activity associated with uh, uh, patients who uh, suffer from acute forms of epilepsy, not responsive to drugs. There's a resection procedure that's used to treat those kinds of patients. And the first step involves mapping electrical activity, finding the region of the brain that's responsible for the seizure, and then resecting it out. And so having high resolution, high uh, fidelity mapping capability is very important in that context. The residence time in the brain could be a few hours, a few days, that's it. At the under, other end of the spectrum, you might think about devices that go into the body and last the life of the patient. So a sophisticated pacemaker that wraps the entire outside surface of the heart might uh, be something uh, to think about in that regime where the challenges really are in biofluid barriers. How do you keep fluids away from the devices for you know, 50 years when you're in a wa warm saltwater type environment. So those are two uh, areas where, where we and others are active. What we didn't realize when we first kind of uh, started exploring this space is there are opportunities for timescales in between those two, a few days, a few decades, a few weeks, uh, where you might want to put a device into the body, have it last for a finite time, uh, correlated to an intrinsic biological process such as wound healing, uh, for, for example, where the device is providing a diagnostic or therapeutic function in the context of that uh, healing process, but then it's no longer needed uh, once the, the patient emerges uh, from, from that uh, period. Uh, and you would like the device to just simply naturally disappear at that point to avoid what would otherwise uh, be a secondary surgical extraction uh, procedure to remove at that point a device that is just risk and unnecessary device load to the patient. And so uh, that started us thinking about uh, bioresorbable electronics, maybe as a subset of a broader class of technology that we refer to as transient electronics, like any kind of electronic system that can fully or partly dissolve, resorb, or otherwise physically disappear at some programmed rate or at a triggered time. And the applications there are not only in uh, biomedical devices, sort of these temporary therapeutic diagnostic implants, but also maybe as ways to uh, reduce uh, hazardous waste streams associated with discarded consumer electronics, environmental monitors that you might need for a finite time period after which uh, you know, resorption into the environment might be an interesting uh, you know, mode of operation. Also DARPA-like things, DOD uh, you know, concerns around uh, hardware level security and um, unrecoverable or reconfigurable uh, electronics. So let me just say a few words about how we're thinking about uh, bioresorbable uh, electronics for, for biomedical applications. And as a material scientist, you come back to this question, what are you going to use for the semiconductor for a water-soluble class of electronics? And again, you might be drawn to polymers because the intuition could be that there's a lot of chemical flexibility and diversity in the, um, in the types of polymers that you can consider. Maybe you could define uh, chemistries that uh, allow for effective charge transport and also uh, you know, those that would undergo go hydrolysis or deep depolymerization when exposed to, uh, to water. And, um, and you can think, think along those lines, but again, you're, you have to, you know, confront the reality that if, if silicon could work in this context, that, that would be the way to go for the same reasons I mentioned uh, before. And once again, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the intuition would be that uh, a silicon platform is not going to be suitable for a water-soluble kind of electronics because uh, most people think about silicon uh, in the form of a silicon wafer, at least for electronics applications. And if you take a wafer and you put it into a beaker of water, not much is going to happen. Uh, and to zero order, that, that is uh, a, a correct assessment of the situation. But if you look very closely, it turns out that uh, silicon does, in fact, react with water. It undergoes hydrolysis to form silicic acid and a little bit of hydrogen. But it undergoes that kind of hydrolysis reaction at exceptionally low rates, um, rates that uh, would prevent observation of that kind of uh, phenomena in a bulk piece of silicon. But if you're interested, as we were, in these very thin nano ribbons of silicon in your patient, you can take a piece of silicon with those kinds of geometries, place it in a, uh, a phosphate buffered saline solution at physiological pH and temperature, and you can just watch it disappear at a rate of one to five nanometers per day. Uh, and it's happening via surface uh, erosion. Uh, and you can just track it. And so you can just track the thickness of these uh, pieces of silicon as a function of time 
of immersion in an environment like that, and it will dissolve uh, completely for you know 100 nanometer thickness. It's completely gone in about three weeks. So you have to be watching for it, but but it definitely uh, occurs, uh, and that was an observation that that uh, allowed us to really move very rapidly into this uh, area of uh, bioresorbable electronics with silicon as the foundational semiconductor uh, material. Silicic acid is naturally occurring in biofluids. It's bi biocompatible. So we spent a few years just looking at uh, all the different materials combinations, not, not just the semiconductor, obviously, but what are you going to use for the dielectric? How about the interconnect uh, metallization? What are you going to use for the substrate and the encapsulation layer? R wrote a lot of papers. 2013, 2014, to basically put together a toolbox of materials that could be combined uh, to yield uh, you know, high performance uh, electronics built, built around uh, silicon. And so you can do all of that. This is uh, an array of silicon uh, MOSFETs with mobility characteristics very similar to what you would see in a wafer based um, uh, device with similar design rules, high on off ratios. Uh, you can build logic gates, you can uh, construct analog circuits as well. This is a coal pits oscillator where we're using magnesium uh, as the interconnect metallization, SiO2 as a uh, interlayer dielectric, magnesium oxide as a gate dielectric in this case, silicon nano ribbons as the semiconductor, and here we're using silk fibrin as a substrate and an encapsulation layer. Silk is already FDA approved for sutures and, and other kinds of uh, bi biomedical devices. So this performs as you would expect based on the circuit design and sort of the wafer scale performance characteristics of the transistor and the high speed uh, diode, but it's unique defining characteristic is is entirely water soluble to biocompatible endpoints at, at a molecular level. And so this is uh, sort of what it looks like DARPA was funding us uh, back in those days. They wanted a movie showing it. So this is uh, silk in more or less an amorphous state, so it's almost dissolving immediately upon contact with water, uh, and the whole thing uh, will disappear uh, over time. In this case, silicon just uh, silk in a few seconds, magnesium in a few hours, and silicon uh, in uh, a few weeks. So let me uh, describe a couple of applications that we think are interesting, and these that were uh, are examples that were brought to us by uh, our clinical collaborators. Um, and so they are addressing real uh, cl clinical needs. These are not things that, that we're, we're making up or identifying. We're responding to inbound uh, interest. The first is in a diagnostic sensing modality. And so here, uh, neurosurgeons from Washington University's medical school approached us and identified this uh, challenge or, or unmet clinical need in uh, the care of patients who've suffered from a severe t TBI event. And so if you've suffered that kind of in injury, you come to the uh, emergency room, the first thing that they will do is they'll open up uh, you know, the skull, perform the necessary surgery, and then when they uh, seal up the, su uh, uh, the surgical site, they will leave in the intracranial space uh, sensors of pressure and uh, temperature. Uh, because those two parameters are critical to monitor so that the pressures don't uh, reach excessive levels that could uh, lead to uh, adverse uh, health consequences. So the problem is you only need it temporarily, but they use a non-resorbable device with a wired-based uh, connection. And so the concept was if you could get rid of that, you make a wireless resorbable device, you put it in, you don't have to worry about extracting it back out. You can completely suture the uh, surgical site and eliminate uh, a lot of the risk for uh, infection. So this is more of a um, microelectromechanical device, but it's purely uh, bioresorbable. So it's basically a drumhead membrane with a piezoresistive sensor, so we get an electrical measurement of deflection of that uh, drumhead, and that can be connected to uh, pressure of the uh, surrounding cerebrospinal fluid. And you can achieve range of operation, dynamic range, and accuracy that uh, correlates very nicely to uh, clinical grade uh, pressure monitors, but with this unique feature that the whole thing kind of dissolves away. So that, that, that's kind of what it looks like. We've done a lot of testing in animal models. This is a rat model for uh, TBI. We have a radio unit that mounts subdermally. It's about 95% resorbable, not 100%. It could be, but uh, it's not currently. But that's just subdermal. The device component that goes into the intracranial space is completely uh, bioresorbable. Uh, and you can see very good correlation between uh, this kind of uh, measurement and that uh, which is performed with a wired, non-resorbable uh, device, both, both at the level of the pressure uh, and the temperature. So that's uh, an example in diagnostics, uh, but maybe more interestingly would be opportunities in uh, therapeutic function, so almost like an electronic medicine, back to the title uh, of the talk. And so this was a separate group of neurosurgeons at uh, Washington University that highlighted this different uh, opportunity. And so I'll block this so you don't have to look at that uh, while I'm talking. <laughs> so, 
So this is in the context of uh, severe injuries to peripheral nerves. So if you suffer a transection injury or a crush injury, you will go into the hospital, the emergency room, they will open you up. They will typically suture the uh, damaged nerve uh, endings uh, together. Uh, and that's kind of what's uh, il illustrated uh, here. And then during the, um, the uh, operating, in, in the operating room uh, context, they will, uh, for about 30 minutes or an hour, apply an electrical stimulation to a distal site on the nerve. And that electrical stimulation is known for reasons that aren't uh, uh, completely clear to lead to accelerated rates of neuroregeneration. So you do that stimulation for a certain uh, period in that intraoperative setting, then you close the patient up, uh, they go home, uh, and then they recover. They stay in the hospital and then they uh, recover. And so the, the concept was that if you could uh, deliver this kind of stimulation in a dosed regimen throughout the healing process beyond that intraoperative period, maybe you could enhance the benefit of this kind of accelerated neuroregeneration induced by stimulation. So the vision was, um, you know, do the intraoperative stimulation as usual, but, but leave in the body a piece of resorbable electronics that would allow you to wirelessly, in a triggered way, stimulate uh, the nerve at different time points during the course of a few weeks as the, as the patient is healing. Uh, and then at that point, when the device is no longer needed, it would simply be programmed to, uh, to bioresorb and disappear, thereby eliminating the need to try to extract that device back out of the body and disentangle it from the very fragile uh, peripheral nerve that, that, it, it, that it's interfaced, uh, interfaced to. And so we were able to put together, we had all these materials already in hand and it just became sort of an electrical engineering project to put it together. And these are uh, wirelessly powered and wirelessly triggered electrical nerve simulators consisting of a cuff interface to the nerve and then a wireless receiver unit here with silicon electronics to do the rectification and the smoothing. Uh, and so it's all uh, bioresorbable as well. It's thin and flexible, so it doesn't impose a lot of forces uh, on, on the nerve. So there's no uh, you know, consequence of, of the presence of the device. And we've done many, many animal studies by now, rat models of damage uh, to uh, the sciatic nerve in this case. We implant, uh, implant the device in, you can see it you can see it here, and then we have a, a coil to deliver the electrical stimulation at different dosing levels. And so now you have to explore what is the optimal dose. No, nobody knows, but this is uh, kind of what, what we do. We had th three groups. One was just the intraoperative stimulation. That's the, the black curve here. And this is EMG amplitude. So it's a measure of the degree of healing of the damaged nerve, and this is time and weeks. The red uh, data points uh, correspond to three days of electrical stimulation. Uh, and then the blue is six days. Uh, and so what you see is as you increase the duration of stimulation and you push it out over time, you increase the rate of neuroregeneration as identified by the slope here. But then you also improve the end outcome uh, as well. The saturation point at 10 weeks uh, leads to higher levels of recovery with electrical stimulation uh, than, than without. So we think about this as an engineered sort of electronic type of medicine. It operates like a pharmaceutical in the sense that it's not present in the body uh, forever, but, but unlike a drug-based or chemistry-based uh, approach to therapy, this is uh, determined entirely by uh, engineering principles and electrical stimulation uh, in this case. And so we're very proud of the fact that we're able to uh, publish it in Nature Medicine. So we convinced the editors that it is, in fact, a medicine. And so that was kind of, uh, kind of interesting. So uh, we've done all the histology, you can kind of, kind of look at this. And I think this is just a starting point for a number of different sort of temporary electrical stimula uh, stimulation uh, devices that you can uh, think of outside of the context of uh, just damaged uh, peripheral nerves. And it turns out that uh, temporary cardiac pacemakers are important uh, to uh, provide sort of a pacing functionality as a patient recovers from an open heart surgery. So we're working with uh, cardiologists at Northwestern to develop this type of uh, technology. So again, it provides that temporary stimulation uh, function. And you might ask, well, why not just use a non-resorbable one? You go in, it's a, it's a secondary surgery, sure, but you can still pull it out. The problem is, uh, especially in this cardiac space, is that the uh, stimulators themselves become uh, coated in tissue, and so it becomes very invasive to try to rip them back out. Uh, on the other hand, if they're built out of resorbable materials, you don't need to worry about it. It would just naturally uh, dis disappear. And so this is uh, this is an area of uh, current work, sort of unpublished results, but we've uh, done demonstrations now in, in rats, in rabbits, and in humans, not actual human patients. These are organ donors, so these are explanted hearts, but uh, we can uh, deliver the kind of electrical stimulation that you need for 
pacing even uh, sort of at a hum human scale. So this, this is another area that we're uh, pretty excited about. So there are other things as, as well in uh, sort of bioresorbable electronic medicines, bone stimulators, thermal therapy, uh, pacemakers, as I mentioned, programmable drug release that also uh, look, look promising uh, to us. So with that, I'll just go ahead and uh, conclude. I think I'm more or less on time here. So as I mentioned at the outset, everything that we do is very highly collaborative. Our expertise in sort of electronic material science gets leveraged very strongly, you know, against mechanical engineering, neuroscience, dermatology, uh, neonatology, physical rehabilitation, all sorts of different things. So I want to uh, acknowledge some of the key uh, senior PIs in engineering science uh, that we worked with uh, over the years, uh, fantastic uh, collaborators, uh, and then many, many people throughout uh, sort of a clinical medical uh, community and, and rehabilitation uh, as well. But I'll kind of end kind of where I, where I started, which was uh, an acknowledgement of the people who actually do the work. I said that I only talk about it, and that's more or less true these days. So they, they're doing it all and coming up with a lot of the, the best ideas. So I want to acknowledge all, all their hard work, and thank you for your, uh, for, your, uh, for your time and your interest. That's the real sort of design challenge, right? It's sort of a materials challenge more than anything, is you have to build your devices out of materials that will ultimately disappear completely, right? But they have to be present in a way that allows stable operation over a time frame of interest, right? Locked to the bi biology that you're trying to track or, or stimulate. So um, there are two ways to do it. One, conceptually, one would be to say, I'm going to understand exactly how fast my materials are dissolving and I'll engineer my system with thicknesses that are such that um, you know, the material won't completely dissolve during the time frame of interest. The problem with that is it's hard to predict. You know, the chemistries are not well defined in the body. The pH could be up and down. The ionic uh, concentration could, could vary. And all of those parameters have a very strong effect on dissolution rate. That's one challenge. The other challenge is that as the active materials begin to dissolve, the resistances change you know, the function starts to drift. It becomes a really difficult way to do things. The other way is to define the lifetime with a non-functional capping layer, so an encapsulation layer. And that's pretty much what we do in, in, in all of these uh, systems in almost all cases. So, so, you know, naturally occurring wax materials turn out to be pretty good uh, water barriers. They will ultimately dissolve in the body. They're very hydrophobic. So they uh, serve as a way to keep water and biofluids away from the active materials during the time frame of interest. So you choose the chemistry and thicknesses of these non-functional materials to, uh, to hold off the water dur during the time that the devices need to operate. Polyanhydrides, certain ones are, are pretty good in that sense. Uh, spin on glasses as well. Uh, organically modified ceramics are, are good. You can change the chemistry there to change the dissolution rate. They apply as thin films and so they, they can serve uh, in that role uh, as well. But that, that's kind of the design approach that, that we, we've taken. So as those encapsulating materials are dissolving, they are having no impact on the underlying function of, of the devices. They're, they're just thinning, and at some point they'll be thin enough that water will penetrate through and then everything will, will dissolve on a relatively fast time scale after that. It's a big challenge, actually. It's a great question. A lot of people don't think about it. But like, if you want to do things on human subjects, you want to have statistical relevance, you have to have the way, uh, a means to build maybe 200 devices. Maybe your yields are not perfect, so you get on 100 patients, right? And how do you do that with the kind of process repeatability that allows you to get valid statistics out? So we sort of take a hybrid approach. A lot of the um, sort of most advanced engineering concepts we embed at the level of devices that are processed in our academic uh, clean room. Those to typically don't scale well for pilot studies on, on humans, those, those types of approaches. So they're good for testing out concepts and defining what a future roadmap might be. But once we've demonstrated that those devices work to a certain level, and that's what we've done with the NICU, to go into the developing world as a specific example, how do you do 20,000? You're not going to do it that way. So then you have to start adapting your designs working with 
contract manufacturers who are leaders in the flexible printed circuit board industry modify their process and you try to meet at some point in the middle. And so once you've done that, you can put together a supply chain, you have uh, outsourced manufacturing partners, and then you can make you know, a few thousand devices, tens of thousands ultimately is what we're aiming for uh, going towards the end of this year. So it's kind of a hybrid approach. So some of the very early stuff we'll do, you know, built, you know, manufactured in, in our labs. But you, it doesn't scale. It's a to totally impossible. And, you know, I think if you're looking at new concepts, it's typically the case that they are not aligned with current manufacturing process. Otherwise, it wouldn't be new, right? So, so it's, a, it's a kind of an iterative process in, in trying to, to, to get it scaled up. And that, that's the approach that we've used. That's a great question. So there are FDA, IEEE, FCC guidelines on exposure levels to uh, RF radiation. So we are just going by those established guidelines. And so everything we do, we do full modeling, full testing to make sure that we're nowhere near those limits. Um, if your question is whether those limits are valid or not, it's probably a reasonable question. You know, that hasn't been a focus of our research. We're assuming that they are. Uh, but maybe, you know, you, there's some, probably some uncertainty in, in that to some degree. So I think they're pretty conservative estimates to begin with. And then we try to stay a factor of 5 to 10 lower than, than those limits. So there's no, uh, we're not kind of push, pushing the boundaries. But I would say, you know, more generally, your, your comment around, uh, you know, whether technology is moving as quickly as medicine, I mean, I think it's mo moving much, much more quickly. There's no doubt about that. And then you might ask why. Well, you know, there's all kinds of risks. You've got to be uh, super careful with, with all this new stuff. And you ask, why are they still using wires uh, in, in the NICU, right? Uh, part of it is that it's not a very inviting environment for new technology because those babies are pretty much the most precious commodity in the whole hospital, right? And so you're not just going to be able to throw a few devices, see what happens, right? <laughs> and so it's slow. You know, it took us um, almost 18 months just to go through the approval process, look at every single aspect of the materials, the RF exposure, whether there's going to be interference with other equipment in the NICU, are the nurses comfortable with it, on and on and on. So, so I think there are a lot of uh, hurdles and a lot of challenges to doing new technology development in this kind of context. Um, and I think probably a lot of it is, uh, is warranted, that scrutiny is probably warranted, right? It's, it's probably good that, that you have to go, go through that. It does slow things down. But I think uh, for us, it's worth it, you know, to kind of spend the time and, and try, try to, you know, kind of have an impact there. Yeah, so I guess, you know, if we think about like bioresorbable over the horizon, like 3D is like lunatic fringe in terms of like <laughs> biointegration, but probably a direction you, you would want to go uh, ultimately. So we have ways now to, uh, so, so you might ask the question, why, why don't you just take my 3D printer and then, and then print out a structure? You can't print monocrystalline silicon, that's a problem, right? You can't print transistors. It's not, you can do plastics, metals to some extent, some ceramics. There's a lot of great work there, but if you want really high performance electronics in that kind of 3D geometry, I think 3D printing maybe in the future, I don't, not, not now. So, so we've been, um, working on approaches that allow us to take planar microsystems technologies, sort of etch them into uh, different kinds of planar shapes, and then we lift those structures from the source wafer and bond them to a pre-stretched elastomer substrate, uh, bonded at specific lithographically defined sites by uh, tailoring the surface chemistry, and then when we rela relax the pre-strain, it imposes uh, compressive forces on that framework that leads to a nonlinear buckling uh, instability that pushes the structures up into the third dimension in ways that can be deterministically controlled. So it's a process for geometrically transforming 2D into 3D. And I think, you know, it's kind of a um, work in progress for us. I mean, the question would be, like, can I design an arbitrary 3D structure? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, there's a lot of design parameters. It's hard to answer that question. But even if you can't, you can get things into these open kind of 3D networks. And then we're using them as scaffolds to grow cells around them. Or we build 3D structures that go up around organoids, for example, these mini brains and so on. We can get electrodes all, all the way around the uh, outside surface of that, that type of system. The nice thing about it, it's fully compatible with any kind of planar technology. Optoelectronics, electronics, MIMS, you can immediately throw things into the third dimension uh, with, with a lot of design 
versatility. Not completely open in terms of the, the topologies and the layouts, but you can access a lot of different shapes that I think are going to be uh, relevant. So, you know, the longer term question is how do you integrate them with the human body? And that's, that's a little bit harder. You're not going to like smush them into a brain or something like that. But, but as a way to grow cells in, in, in ways that allow you to create a skeletal framework for their growth, but also an active one that you can sort of monitor the proliferation and the differentiation, maybe even guide that electrically, optically, thermally, that, that kind of thing, even lo local drug, drug release. So this is something that we and kind of others are, are thinking about. But um, you know, the human clinical relevance is a little bit harder to find uh, on that. That's been a challenge. I mean, if you think about these soft, flexible devices, the first thing you, you worry about is mechanical failure and fracture. Not just fatigue associated with cycling, but you hand somebody one of these devices, the first thing they want to do is like stretch it like that, right? So thinking about ways to embed strain limiting, you know, components to these systems is important. So sometimes we'll use like fabrics, like soft, stretchable fabrics that will you'll have very nonlinear stress strain response. So you get stiffer as you stretch them out. So that, that's kind of one practical consideration around um, you know, hard failure uh, due, due to the mechanics. Um, but you know, in, in terms of uh, more subtle sort of drift or, or slight plastic deformation, these systems can um, you know, exhibit uh, characteristics that look like it's linear elastic, but where you've had plastic deformation in small corner parts of these, uh, these shaped filaments. So the underlying elastomer will return the entire system back to its original geometry, more or less. But you can get this plastic deformation in a very tiny region. So you have to do a lot of uh, slick cyclical testing. You know, so we have all kinds of apparatus to, to bend over and over again, and stretch, and twist, and things like that. So we sort of study things at an experimental level using those, those kinds of approaches. But then we're also very uh, closely coupled into Yanggang Huang's group. So we know from a, a, a theoretical mechanics engineering uh, standpoint that we're developing a device that will offer this range of stretchability, this degree of bendability, this degree of ability to twist before we reach strain levels in the constituent materials that would lead to fracture or plastic deformation. So they're designed to be reliable up front over a certain range of, of strains, uh, for example, system level strains. And then we sort of try to validate that uh, experimentally. So those are some uh, mechanics issues that you have to grapple with as a result of the uniqueness and the mechanical properties of these systems. For the implants, the biggest thing is keeping biofluids out. It just turns out to be really, really challenging. I mean, if you think about it, like a pacemaker or a cochlear implant that exists today, all the electronics is encapsulated in a can, typically ceramic or titanium can with wall thickness of uh, you know, a couple of millimeters to keep the biofluids out. Here we're talking about active electronics that has to flex. I mean, that's the key feature to be able to conform to the contours of the tissues that we're interested in. So we can't use a titanium can. Uh, but at the same time, even if you have a one pinhole defect, biofluids will come in. It'll move laterally. You'll get electrical uh, leakage current back out, damaging the tissue. The uh, ingress of the biofluids will begin to dissolve the silicon, for example. It's a disaster. So you have to have a way to do thin film encapsulation over macroscopic areas and your def defect tolerance is almost zero because you can't handle even one pinhole. So we worked on that problem probably for six or seven years trying to figure it out. You think ALD, okay, maybe PCVD, what, you know, all these different things. And part of it is you're in an academic clean room, so some of the kind of extrinsic effects that lead to defects that, that prevent uh, you, know, you from encapsulating in a practical sense, maybe that could be solved, you know, in a more controlled industri industrial setting. But, um, but it's difficult because typically those encapsulation layers are laid down after the, the active components are already defined. And so it's chemically heterogeneous across the area and it has topology. So even if you don't have pinhole defects, the way that the nucleation happens in the ALD may, may differ across, across the area. So it's very, very challenging. What we ended up doing is using thermally grown dense layers of silica formed on a separate wafer and then like mechanically transfer. So you have all of a pristine sort of fully optimized thin impermeable layer of silica. Uh, and you can ca cap these types of devices with, with that type of material. And it turns out to work uh, really well. I mean, you can get 70, 80 year lifetimes. 
limited only by the rate of hydrolysis of the uh, thermal oxide itself, which is very slow, maybe a hundredth of a nanometer per day in physiological conditions. So you have a micron uh, worth of mat material. You get decades out of that. So that's, that's kind of, I don't know if that's the final answer or whatever, but that's the one approach that's worked for us. So those are the kind of reliability, sort of mechanical and then sort of uh, encapsulation, bi biofluid uh, barrier type issues are the, are the ones that, that tend to be the biggest challenges. So he's referring to a, a graduate student team that uh, put together a business plan and they were at the Rice competition just uh, earlier, like, what is it, early this, it was Monday? That's right, yeah, it ended on Saturday, yeah. So they, they did really well. They, they made a, a device that allows um, one to measure flow through cerebrospinal shunts using a skin-mounted platform. So it's a non-invasive way to determine shunt function. And so, uh, I guess that platform is not too different in terms of the overall design principles to the ones that we're going to be deploying into the developing world for neonatal health monitoring. So the time scales there, at this point, I think there's no risk around the engineering designs, the functionality, the manufacturability, all of that has been settled. It's a matter of going through the very rigorous process that the FDA puts in place for devices that are used to, um, to affect clinical decisions. So we have not had to go through that yet because we're running our devices in parallel with the wired systems uh, for maternal, fetal, uh, and neonatal. And that's what we're going to be doing with the gates as well, so we don't have to do that. So we're just collecting data and we're validating the precision, but that data is not being used to inform clinical decisions around care. So to do that and to ultimately commercialize and deploy it at a, a higher scale requires FDA. So for neonatal monitoring systems, you already have an FDA-approved predicate. It's in the form of these wired-based devices. So you only have to show accuracy compared to that FDA-approved predicate. So it's a pretty straightforward path uh, to go through FDA. So we're sort of mapping that out now. It's probably a year and a half to do it. And it's probably cost a million bucks or something like that, just in, in terms of staffing costs and you know, costs to support that. And uh, the same would go for, uh, for Rayos. There is a, a predicate there that's FDA approved, but nobody uses it because it's, it's really clumsy. It's, you know, it uses a diff different approach, but, but it provides a point of comparison. If you don't have the predicate, it's taking a lot longer, you know, may, maybe another two, three years. So, um, so I think for, for us, these are good starting points, right, to, to get, get things moving. And then we can uh, think about uh, measurement modalities that, that aren't currently part of clinical care and, um, and, and get things sort of, sort of going in that area. So I, I think that's probably an answer to your question. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah, I think that's a, that's a great type of concept to, to think about. And there are a number of groups kind of going down that direction. Um, I mean, I think this like sensor dust I, idea has kind of, kind of been around. and. Uh, I think some of the things that you, you've done maybe kind of move things in that direction a little bit, these uh, mi micro machines and so on. Um, I think it's interesting. If you talk to um, clinicians, they will, uh, the first question they will ask any type of implantable device is, how do I get it back out if I need to get it out, right? So having something that's all interconnected together, so a single operation could pull it out if something goes wrong, is something they, they think about a lot. So something that's distributed, that that's, tends to be scary to most you know, physicians that I've, I've talked about. Yeah, that, that, would, that, would, that was kind of where I was going, going next. So that second part of my answer is exactly what, what you suggested. So you make things that um, you know, aren't permanent in the body, and you don't have to extract them. You let them dissolve away. The challenge, though, with anything that's uh, free-floating, if there's any chance that it gets into the bloodstream, it's a disaster because it can um, lead, to, uh, lead to clogging and... Um, uh, stroke and things like that if you're in, in the brain, right? So, um, so it's for that reason we haven't done anything in transient electronics that involves insertion into, uh, into the vas vasculature, sort of separated out. But, but if you've kind of um, you know, thought that through, then I, I think it's a great concept. Th those are the two, two uh, you know, con concerns that would want, one would have is where they're going, they're free, free floating, you know, <laughs> you can control where they're at, but, and then uh, getting them back up. Uh, that's a great question. I, I t we tend to, um, I don't know, I guess I get answered in a few ways. I think 
the students are driving everything at the end of the day. Like I can have my own ideas, like I want to go in this direction, but if I don't have enthusiastic students kind of doing it, then, uh, then not a lot happens. So I, I think, you know, the, the students are, are defining kind of a prioritization in a sense. The most talented students working on problems that they're most passionate about, almost by definition, define kind of where, where we end up going. So I would say that's, that's one thing, is that the students help with that prioritization and that selection. I mean, I do, do my part, but, you know, I'm not rigidly, you know, tasking. I'm not a taskmaster in that sense. So the students are offered flexibility. So it kind of self-assembles in that sense. I would say along a similar line um, are collaborators. You know, the, the, the collaborations that, that are working really, really well uh, oftentimes define directions that are most productive. Because I think a lot of, lot of these things make, make sense and have a, uh, a chance for, for impact. And of those that do, I think the directions that we go are, are defined to, to a large extent by the, by the collaborators that, that we put together. And that may not only include sort of the, the clinical folks, but also industrial collaborators will come in and approach us and let's go do this kind of product and we'll, we'll team with them. So I think it's less a grand plan and more a portfolio of opportunities and then self-assembly kind of takes, takes over and we, we go, go after these different things. So, Kind of a fuzzy answer to that question, but I think that's how it works in practice.